So could our universe be a simulation program by the gods? Uh, the electron is perhaps the fundamental particle. We know precisely its wavelength, its mass, its charge. Uh, but we've never found the electron itself. Uh, this is from the AI chat GPT. Uh, according to current scientific understanding, the electron is a point-like particle, meaning that it is a very small object that is effectively a point in space and has no size. Uh, while it is possible to imagine such an object in a purely theoretical sense, uh, there is no evidence to suggest that objects without size actually exist in the physical world. Uh, it is possible that the electron could be considered a mathematical particle. This is because if it is indeed a dimensionless point, then it would have no physical size or shape, and its properties and behavior would be described by mathematical equations rather than physical characteristics. Uh, now, GPT is noting that any object in 3D space must have a physical size or shape, and so Although the parameters of mass, wavelength, and charge of the electron are well studied, science cannot say what the electron itself is. And so the electron is inferred by these parameters. For physics, the actual electron, like God, is a matter of faith. Uh, GPT also opens the possibility that the electron itself could be a mathematical particle, not a physical particle, although its parameters, its mass, wavelength, and charge are physical. How the gods programmed physical parameters of mass, space, and time from mathematical structures like the electron uh, is the key to the simulation universe. Uh, this could be called the mathematical electron theory, for although it, uh, for it is the formula for the electron that reveals how the gods did it. This electron formula, which is this Fe, uh, resembles the formula for torus volume, or equally the surface of a 4D sphere. In other words, it has a geometrical construct, and although it has no units or dimensions, uh, because it is just a geometrical formula, embedded within this formula is the information required to give those parameters of mass, wavelength, and charge. Uh, it uses two constants, the well-known fine structure constant alpha and this omega whose value is close to 2. Uh, these two constants themselves have no dimensions. No one has yet been able to derive this alpha, although they've been trying for 100 years. Uh, and so these constants may be part of the universe source code itself. Uh, alpha and omega have numerical values, and so we can solve this Fe formula numerically. Uh, embedded within this formula uh, are the electron parameters, which means that electron mass, wavelength, and charge are also geometrical formulas uh, and can also be solved numerically. Uh, here is a table which lists formulas for mass, time, length, and charge. Uh, these are analogous to our Planck units. Uh, to convert from these geometrical objects to our Planck units, we can use scalars. Uh, the scalars are explained in a video on the physical constant anomalies. Uh, here is the clip. Alpha and omega have numerical values, and so, for example, we can solve the numerical value for the velocity object v. Uh, we then want to convert to our speed of light c, which is measured in meters per second. So we include a scalar, this small v. Here, c equals geometrical v times scalar v. If we want to measure in miles per second, then we change scalar v accordingly. Uh, if we meet aliens, then they will have a different V, uh, depending on their unit system. Uh, we can construct a magnetic monopole using our objects ampere and length, the units for a magnetic monopole being the ampere meter. Uh, we then take a unit of time T and combine these together to get the electron formula Fe. Our scalars and units have cancelled, uh, and so Fe is a dimensionless mathematical formula. Uh, conversely, we can take this Fe formula and break it up to get our magnetic monopoles and time t. And so embedded within the dimensionless electron formula are the dimensioned units that give us electron mass, wavelength, frequency, and charge. 
we can confirm the accuracy of our results by including the ultra-precise Reitberg constant. Uh, we also see that these electron units derive from our Planck objects for mass, length, time, and charge. Uh, for example, if we look at the electron mass formula, we see that it is a unit of Planck mass followed by the Fe formula. What this appears to mean is that we have an occurrence of a unit of Planck mass. Are there no mass for the duration of Fe, then back to a unit of Planck mass? If we look at wavelength and charge, we see that they occur for the duration of Fe. In other words, the electron is an oscillation between the mass state which occurs for one unit of Planck time and is a unit of Planck mass, followed by the electric wave state, which occurs for the duration of Fe, about 10 to the 23 units of Planck time. And so the electron formula not only embeds the dimensioned units, which give the electron its properties of mass, wavelength, frequency, and charge, but the electron formula also dictates their frequency. Uh, returning to mass, this also means that mass is not a constant property of the electron. Uh, when we talk about electron mass, we are referring to the frequency of occurrence of this unit of Planck mass. Uh, there is a formula we can apply to the energy of the electron, E equals HF. Uh, this H, which is Planck's constant, uh, is a constant. The F is a variable. F tells us the frequency of this H. The more often this H occurs, the greater the energy. Uh, there's another formula E equals mc squared. Now, if we have this oscillation between point mass and electric wave, then for every wave state, and the wave state gives us this hf term, we have a mass state, which gives us m equals c squared, mc squared. And so the energy of each state, wave and mass, should be the same. However, C is a constant, and so the M term is now our variable. M doesn't refer to mass as a constant property of the particle, but rather the frequency of occurrence of this unit of Planck mass. Uh, this means that we don't need a Higgs boson to explain electron mass. Uh, we can just use our Planck units, which we can get from the electron anyway. This formula Fe looks to be perfectly symmetrical, no geometrical fracture points where it could be broken. And so we would expect the electron to be perfectly spherical when placed in 3D space and to be virtually indestructible. Uh, electrons would seem to have no reason to spontaneously decay. The proton has identical charge to the electron, but of opposite sign. Uh, and so we would expect the proton to be also composed of magnetic monopoles. Uh, the proton has quarks, three of them. The electron has monopoles, uh, those AL geometries, also three, but in the form AL to the power of three. Uh, we are adding the exponents. And so could it be that the proton quark is a magnetic monopole? We don't see quarks in the electron, but that might be because we can't break up the electron to see what's inside. We can make our electron using this AL combination. Uh, we can also use temperature. And so we have potentially two different types of quarks, one using charge, the other using temperature. The AL combination has a unit number minus 10. The temperature quark has a unit number 20. Uh, and so we could compare these with the U quark and the D quark. The advantage with this approach is that we don't need quarks. Once again, we're just using our Planck units. And as noted, these we can get from our electron. This electron is a self-contained formula. Presumably, if the electron itself is a mathematical particle, then so too are other particles like the proton and the neutron. And as particles form atoms, which then form our solid world of planets and stars, and that includes us, uh, then we could be mathematical people, albeit with physical dimensions, in a mathematical universe. Uh, the electron mathematics is on this site. I'm using the wiki format for convenience. Uh, the links are below. First heard about it on the BBC News going home. Um, on five o'clock news, 
and they talked about this new discovery which is going to change the world of particle physics and how we understand the universe and I'm going oh and they talked about the uh, how the electron is a perfect sphere and I'm thinking well what, what experiment is this it's and gradually as they talked a little bit more I realized it's I knew what the experiment was and I even know the people who have done it they were my colleagues in Sussex and so uh, I know Johnny Hudson and Ed Hines very well and Ben Sauer and so it was really great to hear about the experiment. I'd never thought about it as being the electron is a sphere. I'd thought about it as the electron dipole moment. Somehow I don't think if they'd have talked about the electric dipole moment of the electron, that might not have made the BBC news. I, I can't give you the heavy experimental details because it's too complicated for a theorist like myself, but I can tell you some of the background. First of all, why, why say the electron is a, a sphere? When we, we think of the electron actually as a fundamental particle, it's one of the building blocks of, 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 of uh, the standard model. And normally you think of that as a point-like object. So what does it mean to say it's a sphere? And I think what they're really talking about is the charge. The electron's got a charge, uh, an electric charge. And, and they're talking about the distribution of that charge. They've measured it to be almost spherical. And in fact, to show the precision of their experiment, they've demonstrated that that distribution, if, if they could scale it up to the size of the solar system, then it would be a sphere to within a hair's breadth. They could measure a deviation of a hair's width. So a sphere the size of the solar system, they could measure a deviation of that charge distribution of a hair's width. It turns out that the, that distribution of the charge around the electron is, is really important in understanding the nature of the matter-antimatter asymmetry, the fact that we live in a universe made up mainly of matter, very little antimatter around, and yet we believe in the early universe they were created in equal amounts. So what has happened? And the, by finding this, a deviation of, of this charge from this, the perfectly spherical charge, you, we would hopefully gain some information about this origin of this matter antimatter asymmetry. So let me step back before I go into those details and perhaps just talk a little bit about the, what, what it means to be not spherical. So, so a spherical distribution of charge, basically the way I think about it anyway, is that if you happen to have a, a, a detector that could pick up charge, could measure charge, then if, if my electron is here, then the detector would pick up an equal amount of charge on this side as it would on this side as it would up and down and all the way around it would be perfectly spherical. It wouldn't see any uh, preferential distribution of charge. That's called a monopole by the way where, it, where it's equally distributed like that, a spherical distribution. 